the indirect method and how we're going to prepare the operating activity section under the indirect method. We need to remember that what's happening under the indirect method is we start with net income and we're going to make a number of adjustments to net income to come up with cash from operating activities. These are the same adjustments under the direct and the indirect method. It's just a matter of how it is that they are being presented. There are five steps that we're going to have to go through. We're going to look at each of them. We start by eliminating non-cash items from the income statement. Those items there that didn't have a cash element to it, like depreciation. We then need to eliminate non-operating activity transactions that are included in the income statement. That gain on the sale of fixed assets. Well, the transaction, the sale of the fixed asset, that's an investing activity. So we need to adjust for that. We then need to adjust for changes in operating account balances. And this is where we're going to spend the most time because this is where we have to look and make adjustments for those credit sales we made at the end of December that we didn't collect this year. And the collections we made in January for the sales that we made the previous year. So we're going to look at those adjustments that we need to make. We need to then potentially adjust for trading security activities and we have a couple of specific disclosures that we need to make under the indirect method. And so these are the five steps. The first step, eliminate the non-cash items. We've got on the income statement things that didn't have cash connected to them. Because there is no cash, we need to adjust for that. The most common examples of this are depreciation expense and amortization expense. We have net income. Net income was reduced by depreciation expense, but it wasn't a cash payment. So depreciation expense, amortization expense, and the other non-cash expenses need to be added back to net income because there was not a cash outflow connected to those. So depreciation expense, amortization expense added back, and any other non-cash item also needs to be eliminated, but those are the ones you're most likely to see. The second step is to eliminate those non-operating activities that are included in the income statement. The income statement includes all transactions, okay, or almost all except for those that are part of other comprehensive income, but that doesn't impact the statement of cash flows. So we have some activities that were not operating activities that are in the income statement. Well, if we're going to adjust the income statement to make it operating activities, we need to take out those non-operating activities. These are going to have to be taken out. They're creating gains and losses on the income statement, but it is not an operating activity that gave rise to those gains and losses. So any gains are subtracted from net income and losses are added back to net income. Those events are going to be recorded in most likely the investing section, possibly the financing section, but that gain on the sale of fixed assets, that's not an operating activity. There needs to be in the, in the investing section cash received from the sale of fixed assets. Okay? So we eliminate the non-operating activities. This takes us to the big area, individual account adjustments. We've taken out the non-cash items, we've taken out those investing financing activities, and now what we need to do is we need to make adjustments for all the operating activities that either didn't involve cash or cash transactions that aren't in the income statement. Okay? We need to make adjustments for this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at individual asset and liability accounts and we're going to have to make adjustments for the changes in the balance during the period. Now, what are these operating activity accounts? Well, accounts receivable, accounts payable, inventory. Okay, those are the big ones. Those are accounts. They're on the balance sheet. They are operating activities though. Why do we have receivables? Because we sold to customers. Why do we have payables? Because we bought something from our supplier. And so these account balances, we need to adjust for them because payables and receivables, there's, there's no cash in that right away. We recognize the revenue, but we don't collect the cash. We recognize the expense, but we don't pay the cash. And so we need to make adjustments for changes in the balances of these operating activity accounts. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a few adjustments, the big ones, and then we're going to have a specific a rule that you can apply, even if you forget the specific ones that we look at. So we're going to look at a few, and then we're going to give a rule that can be used. The first adjustment 
It's for accounts receivable. We need to adjust net income for the change in the accounts receivable balance during the period because at the end of December we sold things to our customers and we didn't collect the cash. And so that is income that we recognized, revenue that we recognized without cash. And so that ending accounts receivable balance, that's not a cash inflow. So we need to take that out of net income. But similarly, what we had at the beginning of the period was beginning receivables. We collected the cash this period, but we didn't recognize it on the income statement. And so we need to add beginning receivables to the income number because that was cash we collected, but we didn't recognize income on the income statement this period. So we need to make an adjustment for beginning and ending receivables. But the good news is we can kind of simplify it. We can make it for the change in the balance during the period. If accounts receivable increased during the period, the amount of that increase is subtracted from net income. If accounts receivable decreased during the period, that decrease in accounts receivable is added to net income. Okay? So that's the adjustment for accounts receivable. If accounts receivable goes up, it means we sold things without collecting it. If it goes down, it means we collected without selling. So we need to make that adjustment to get net income into cash from operating activities. Now that's the adjustment for accounts receivable. We also need to make an adjustment for accounts payable. And this adjustment for the change in accounts payable is really the same thing as it was for receivables except the other direction. On December 31st we bought something but didn't pay for it. On January 1st we paid for something but we didn't buy it. So we have that same process that we have in terms of the adjustment for the change in accounts payable. Increase in accounts payable is added to net income. A decrease in accounts payable is subtracted from net income. And you might just be sitting there thinking, well, wait a second. We just said that an increase in receivables is added to net income. I'm sorry, an increase in receivables is subtracted from net income. And now we just said that an increase in payables is added to net income. Yes, because payables and receivables are different. One's an asset, one's a liability. Okay? So, the way we adjust for assets and liabilities is different, and this is leading up to our general rule. The last item that we need to look at individually is inventory. Now, inventory is a little bit unique because we have a step between purchasing it, it goes to inventory, and then it becomes cost of goods sold. But, if inventory goes up, it means that we've paid money, but we haven't expensed the item yet. It's not on cost of goods sold. If we inventory has gone down, it means we expensed items that we didn't pay for. And so we need to make an adjustment for the change in the inventory balance. An increase in inventory is subtracted from net income, and a decrease in inventory is added to net income. Now, this adjustment, these two adjustments for inventory, are exactly the same as the adjustments for accounts receivable. Increase in accounts receivable, subtracted. Increase in inventory, subtracted. Decrease in inventory, added. Decrease in accounts receivable, added. And so when we're looking at all of these operating activity accounts, we have a very standard rule that we can apply. For asset accounts, okay, receivables, inventory. If the asset account increases, we subtract the amount of that increase from net income. If the asset account decreases, that is added to net income. For liabilities, if the liability account, payables for example, increases, it is added to net income. If the liability account decreases, it is subtracted from net income. So here's the rule. Asset accounts, the adjustment is the opposite of the change. If the asset account goes up, you subtract it. If the asset account goes down, you add it. Liabilities, on the other hand, the adjustment is the same direction as the change. If the liability goes up, you add it. If the liability goes down, you subtract it. That's the rule. This is what you need to remember. Don't remember, okay, if receivables goes up, that means that we... Don't worry about that. Receivables, an asset. Receivables went up, we subtract it. Payables are a liability. Payables went down, we subtract it. Okay, use this rule 
to go through whatever accounts they give you in the change. Prepaids, unearned revenue. Is it an asset or a liability? This is the way it adjusts. Let it be simple by using this rule to govern how you make your adjustments. Okay, the fourth step is cash flows and trading securities. Okay, cash flows from the purchase sale and the maturity of trading securities are based on the nature in which the securities were acquired. Usually, this means it's operating activities, not investing. But if we look at it and we determine that it really should be investing and not operating, we have to make this adjustment. I don't really expect this to show up in a numerical question, but it's just something that we need to be aware of. And the last item, some specific indirect method disclosures. If the company uses the indirect method, it needs to support, it needs to report two separate numbers. It needs to report how much cash was paid for taxes and how much cash was paid for interest. This is normally done just as a small disclosure at the end of the income, or at the end of the statement of cash flows. And what we're doing here is very important. Under the indirect method, we don't have a line cash paid for taxes, cash paid for interest. We have a line that says adjustment for changes in tax payable, adjustment for changes in interest payable, but we don't have an actual dollar amount of cash paid for taxes and interest. Those are significant numbers. The amount of cash we paid for taxes is more important than the amount of cash we paid to, supp or to suppliers or to employees. Because if the company doesn't pay its taxes, that's illegal. There might be penalties, there's fines. If the company doesn't pay the interest it needs to pay, it might default on the debt, it might become callable, there might be penalties they have to pay. And so what we need to disclose under the indirect method is how much cash was paid for taxes and how much cash was paid for interest. Those numbers are not in the indirect method. They're in the direct method. Because under the direct method, there is a line, cash paid for taxes, cash paid for interest. But the way the indirect method is presented, it isn't done that way. And so that needs to be disclosed separately. So preparing the indirect method, we've got just a few things that we need to do. We need to first eliminate non-cash items from the income statement. We need to eliminate non-operating activity transactions from the income statement. And then we need to make those adjustments for the operating accounts. The rule, assets adjust opposite. The asset account goes up, you subtract it from net income. Liabilities adjust the same way. The liability account increases, you add it to net income. We then have to make the adjustments for trading securities potentially and we need to disclose cash paid for taxes, and cash paid for interest. This is how we do the indirect method. The adjustments under the indirect method are exactly the same as the adjustments under the direct method. What you need to know for the exam is how these adjustments are done under the indirect method, and this is how we prepare the operating activities section in the statement of cash flows under the indirect method.